Acts chapter 19 is where we're at this morning, but as we get started and continue to uh, walk through the book of Acts together, um, reminded, please be in prayer for the, um, the Ashmore family. Uh, the receiving friends for Jimmy is this afternoon from 2 to 4 at Petty Funeral Home, uh, and then service will be right here at the church tomorrow at 2 o'clock, so uh, please be in prayer uh, for their family as uh, they uh, grieve the loss of Jimmy's uh, as far as on, our, on earth, but at the same time celebrate uh, Jimmy's homegoing uh, to be with the Lord. So we're very thankful uh, for that reality today. So uh, in your Bibles, Acts chapter 19, we're going to be in looking at just a few verses today, actually verses 8 through 12. Um, If I can get it opened up in there, sometimes it wants to close up on me instead of staying open where it's supposed to. But um, today, uh, talking about investing in the right places. Uh, You know, I I really, sometimes you struggle with with various titles and different things. And uh, today, I struggled a little bit with what our title was going to be. I'm going to try not to step on that. Um, But but thinking about investment, you know, I I told the first service, and and I say to you, I'm not, it's not like I have a whole lot of money to invest or anything, but I, I do know a little bit about investing in the fact that you need to understand what you're investing in. Uh, because if you don't, or you invest your money in the wrong places, um, it, it, can, it can hurt in the long run, right? I don't know how many of you may remember it. It was it's big in, in the area where I lived um, back, I may have been as many as 20 or more years ago, but there was a, a company called Carolina Investors. Uh, some of you up this way may have been familiar with them, but they uh, a lot of people invested with them. They always had the highest interest rates. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things. Be careful what people are mentioning because it may not always be um, on the up and up. But they were. And they had been, they'd been around for a long time. And a lot of people had invested money with them. And I knew several people who were already retired and who had their money with them. And they were drawing their retirement out of there. And uh, really out of the blue, nobody knew anything. But there was a lot of things behind the scenes that were going on that weren't above board. And they, um, so they, uh, one day people went up to Carolina Investors. It kind of looked like a little bank there. And and there's, I I always remember the one there in Easley where I lived. And they walked up to it. And when they went up to the door, there was a note on the door that basically said, we're closed, we're bankrupt, sorry. I mean, I I mean, it said more than that, but that was kind of the gist of it. So people who had invested all of their life savings. They had taken their retirements out of others and rolled it over into that to get a good interest rate so they have a a good thing to, a good nest egg to live on the rest of their life and take care of them throughout their retirement years, all of a sudden had nothing. I mean, literally nothing. And I I, I remember people that I knew, people that I went to church with or people that, you know, some elderly folks who were already retired. I say elderly, older folks already retired. I remember seeing them going back to work. Uh, seeing them at different places and, and like, what are you? And they had to go back to work because they had invested in something that they thought was the right thing, but they probably hadn't done. Maybe, maybe they couldn't have done any homework. I don't know, but they invested in something that ended up the return fell apart. You know, we we have something that we're called to invest in, and, and we need to invest our life. You know, our finances. We we need to invest. We need to be wise. But I want to tell you something: the most important investment we have is our lives. We only have one of them. We only get one. And we need to invest our lives into something that is going to create a positive return. Well, folks, I can't think of anything better to invest my life in than the cause of Christ because not only is it a good return for me eternally, it can also be a great return for others eternally. I believe that's exactly what the Apostle Paul understood. And I believe that's why he endured all that he endured throughout those missionary journeys with being rejected, being beaten, being cast aside, being kicked out of synagogues, all those kind of things. I believe that's why he endured, because he realized that this is simply an investment. And if I know anything about investments, I'm not a, Mike Ashworth told me I was right. I shared this one time a while back, and he told me I was right, and he's an investment guy, so so I'll believe him. Um, You know, when I'm looking at investments, I don't want something that goes from here to here on a straight line. Because there's only one way to go, right? I want to see something that over time, maybe it's gone up and it's, it's hit a valley, it's back up, it's down. But overall, it's moving in an upward trajectory. That's a solid 
something to invest in. Well, you know, that's kind of like life, isn't it? I know a lot of people who have come into church. Maybe they, they got invited to church. They, they, man, we, we sing some great songs like we've sang this morning. We have an emotional experience. They come down. They pray a prayer. And poof, they shoot off. Man, they're way up here. And they're on, the, they're on the high. And Man, they're just going. And all of a sudden, they disappear. They're gone. Mainly because we've done, I think, a poor job of telling people what it really means to follow Christ. And I think that's exactly what we see in our little small passage of Scripture today that Paul is trying to do. One of the things that Paul did is he invested time. He invested his talents. He invested in the right things because he understood that life is difficult. He understood that there are going to be ups and downs. And if we're going to continue the trajectory of our life toward Christ, if we're going to continue the trajectory of our Christ toward uh, a, a positive return on our investment, it must be invested in the right thing. And I want to tell you what, we invest our lives in so much today. But the most important thing we can do is invest our lives in Christ. In the book of Acts chapter 19, we're going to read in verse 8. And I would ask you if you can to stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word. Just, a, just five short verses. But listen to what Paul is doing here. Paul is, he's in Ephesus. He's on another missionary journey. And it says on, in verse 8 that he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And then listen to these two verses. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. Teach us today according to it. And give us the ability to apply it and live it out. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So today, as we think about investing in the right place, we think about investing in the right things. And, in, and, and one of the greatest investments we can make with our lives is to invest in the lives of others. This was the ministry of Jesus. This was the, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, by all intents and purposes, if we, looked at the, if, if we talked to the church gurus and the church growth gurus and all those people, they would say that Jesus' earthly ministry was a failure because he really only impacted in a deep way 11 guys. It only, one, one, his ministry only lasted for three years, and then he was, he was killed. But secondly, he really only spent all of his time with 11 people. And so, you know, if you looked at all the, the, the self-help stuff and the, the church growth stuff out there today, it would tell you that that was not a wise investment. But I'm going to tell you, you know, standing here 2,000 years later, I'd say it's a pretty good one. I'd say it's a pretty good investment because he, he took that time, that three-year period of, of earthly mission. Now, he, he impacted a lot of people. And here's what I'm saying. We can impact a multitude of people, but we are called to invest our lives in a few. We're, you know, we want a diversified portfolio when it comes to our finances, Right? But at the same time, we all, in that diversified portfolio, we better have a few rock-solid things that we're investing in while this other stuff may be coming and going, right? Well, that's what we do in life, isn't it? In life, we better have some solid relationships. We need to invest in some solid things, and there's a lot of other relationships we may have that we need to have that we're talking to people, we're sharing faith with, and we're doing all those things. But we better have those relationships both that pour into us and then that we pour into Paul is in Ephesus. He does his normal routine. He goes into the synagogue. Hey, I'm, I'm thankful this time we read in this text, he actually made it three months before he got kicked out. I mean, that's a new record for Paul. I mean, yeah, he, 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 usually it's within a week or two. I mean, but Paul comes in, and here's the investment. L listen, to the, listen to what it says here. It says, he entered the synagogue, and he continued speaking out boldly for three months. Now, that Speaking out boldly literally means he was speaking the truth to them. He was telling them the truth about what? About the kingdom of God. 
That last part of that verse says he was talking to them about the kingdom of God. He was reasoning and persuading. He was speaking out truth. Do you realize today how much we need people to speak truth into our lives and how much we need to speak truth into their lives? The, most, the greatest investment, if I'm talking to a financial investor, I want them to tell me the truth. Because this, this is my retirement. This is my uh, livelihood. So listen, let me tell you something. How much more important is it that when we're speaking to people about faith, when we're speaking to people about eternal matters, see, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that some of you are good investors. I'm glad some of you have a nice nest egg to retire on. But I want to tell you what, that matters absolutely kneel when you breathe your last breath on this earth. The greatest investment we have is to invest the truth into people's lives that tells them the truth about what the future holds. That the future, that there is an eternity, that there is a life after this death, that, that there's, there is life after death, and that life, how you live in this life and where you put your faith in this life determines how you spend that eternity. And folks, we need to understand that Paul was speaking the truth to them about Jesus Christ. He was speaking to them out of the Old Testament. He was looking at the prophecies. And then he's he, he tells them about the prophecies. Then he comes over here and he points to the person of Jesus and he said, look, this is how he fulfilled all of those things. This is the Messiah. This is the one that's been told us all of our lives that we must put our faith in, that he's going to come and take our place. He's going to come and set up an earthly kingdom. That's going to be the savior of the world. This is the one, the promise to Abraham, the promise to our fathers, the one to take away the sin of the world. This is Jesus Paul was telling them the truth. You see, the greatest investment we can have is an investment in the truth. I'm thankful for people who are honest with me. And we need to be honest with others. Oh, we beat around the bush, don't we? Oh, man. We talk to our friends. We talk to our coworkers. Well, one day I'll get to that. Well, when is one day going to be? What if, what if it's one day too late? What if they don't make it back to work tomorrow? What if they... I mean, I'm not trying to be, you know, Mr. Mr. Downer up here, but I'm saying that's the reality of life. We all have, we've all know that, right? Especially in the last 18 months, we see that to be very true. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. And we need to be investing in the people's lives, investing in the truth, telling people that without Christ, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary, without his substitution, Without him taking my place, I can't be saved. Without accepting that and receiving that and understanding his, the reality of that truth. It says that Paul went on reasoning and persuading them. In other words, he was, he was that word reasoning means to consider or examine a topic with others. He was warning, he said, look, just look at the proof. Consider it. You know, that's all the Bible tells us to do when we talk to people about our faith, when we start, start to disciple people. And, and that, that he just tells us to tell them the truth to tell them what the Bible says, to tell them what he said? And do you realize that the process of discipleship doesn't, always, doesn't start at salvation? It starts weeks, months, years before that. We love to hear the term disciple or discipleship, and we think, oh, that's what happens after we get saved. No, that should begin the moment I have a conversation with someone. When I invite them to have a cup of coffee with me or I invite them to go, somebody said earlier I kept talking about coffee that was going to invite me to have cake. I said, I'll go have cake. Um, I'll go have nachos or tacos. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm good with anything. But, you know, we're in, in our day, we, we go have coffee because that's the cool thing to do, you know. So, so if you invite them to have coffee or you invite them to have lunch or dinner or whatever, why, invite them for that reason, especially if somebody you know is not involved in church, they're not connected, you, you, you've been around them long enough to realize they probably don't have any kind of faith at all. Invite them and take them somewhere, just like Paul. Now, Paul took a group. I'm telling you, take one, maybe two, and go have lunch with them. Go do something and say, tell them your story. Tell them who you were. Tell them how you met Jesus, and tell them who you are now. Tell them you're not perfect. I mean, you don't lie to them. Tell them you're not perfect. Um, and, 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 just, and then ask them, that, and, hey, can I hear your story? And when they tell you theirs, listen to what they're saying, learn about the person, and then lead them to the place of understanding who Christ is. Listen, learn, and lead. That's all we're called to do. That's what Paul was doing. Paul, you see, you, say, you understand when it says that term reasoning? It, this wasn't, they didn't go every day and Paul sit there and preach. 
They went there and had discussions. They went there and had debates. They went there and, and Paul listened to what they said, and then he took them back to the Scriptures and pointed them to Jesus. That's all we're called to do, folks. We're not called to be theologians. You're not called, every one of us aren't called to be theologians. We're called to know Christ. We're called to know his word. When we hear something that's error, to point them to truth. Jesus said himself, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Anybody ever told a lie in your life? Don't raise your hand. Um, um, most of you have probably this week, maybe this morning. I don't know. Um, you, 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 we all have, right? We've all told lies. Anybody realize when you tell a lie how hard it is to cover up that lie? How many lies do you have to take to cover up one? Uh, a bunch, right? Uh, and, and usually what ends up happening you usually tell one lie. Let some, I'm, talking to, I'm talking to y'all today because I, I, I was one of y'all one of these days a long, a long, long, long time ago. Watch it. Uh, but uh, I remember, you know, I would, I would kind of tell a, a half truth or a partial truth or a just, well, you know what a partial truth is, right? It's a whole lie. Uh, that's exactly right. And I would tell that, and then later on I'd tell my, I had to tell this one to cover that one up. And before, what, what do you always do? You just end up telling on yourself. Because you end up telling this lie that contradicts that lie, and they say, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. And, and, and believe it or not, parents aren't as dumb as you think they are. Uh, we do remember it because we all did it. Uh, that's why we know. So uh, we, we need to be telling the truth. And the thing is, we can either continue to tell lies to people and say, oh, you'll be okay. Oh, you'll be all right. Or we can tell them the truth that you won't be. That if you were to die today without Jesus... It's not going to be good. It's not going to be positive. Which is more loving? To let someone continue on in their belief that they're going to be okay? Or to tell them the truth that if you don't repent and turn to Christ, your eternity is going to be not something you want, not something you want to experience. Paul was reasoning. He was compelled, compelling them. He was telling them the truth about who they were. He was telling them the truth about what they needed to hear. And it says in verse 9 that, but then some became um, disobedient and began speaking evil of the way before the people. In other words, uh, not everybody who's in church is there for the right reasons. I, I'm just saying what the text says, okay? I mean, because they were in church, right? They were in the synagogue, which was church for them. And not everybody who's there is there for the same reason you are. Not everybody who's there is there to worship the Lord. S listen, there are some people, I I've met them. In 21 years of ministry, I've talked to some of them, and I've, they'll, stop, they'll stop coming to church, and I'll go visit them, and I'll talk to them. And I, I was just really there. That, you know, they started a new business, and, and they were trying to make some contacts. And so they come to church to make business contact. Or they come to church to, you know, they figure that, that some dude feels like he, he might can find a decent girl at church. So he's, he, he's coming to church, he's trolling for dates. Or she's trying to find a good dude. I mean, uh, people have all kinds of reasons for coming to church. Sometimes they think it just makes them feel better. But not everybody's there to worship Christ. And some, that, You know how I know that? Because when you begin to speak truth to them, when you begin to preach the truth to them, many times they'll disappear. The truth of the word of Jesus said himself, when I come to preach, it's going to create offense. It's going to create division sometimes. He's trying to bring everybody together, but when we don't believe right about Jesus, folks, we're not on the same page. And this group, they like their power. They like their way of doing things. They like their traditions. They didn't like the fact that Paul and Peter and others like them were coming in and trying to upset the apple cart and turn things around and do things a different way, not to point them to their authority, but to point them to Christ's authority. You know how I know that's still true today? <laughs> in a week from tomorrow, I'll be in Columbia, South Carolina for about three days. Mm, pray for me. Having to be down there. I'm just teasing. I'll be in Columbia for, for two, about two and a half days for the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And somewhere along the way, I'll have a conversation with a pastor friend or, or someone, and we'll talk about where they're at, and they're not at that church anymore. They're over here, or they've started a church because... They either got ran out of that church or that church just was dead and wouldn't do anything and nobody would, you know, would, would get up and work and so they chose to leave or, or, or something along those lines. What is that? It just shows you that not everybody's at church for the same reason. It's like I, I told the first service and went back early on in my ministry, probably 
year three or four, me being in full-time ministry, I, put a res- I was asked for a resume for a church up in the Gaffney area. Um, and uh, I, I remember I didn't, I didn't get it. And I ended up going to Paxville. And I came back later and it was one of my wife's friends that attended that church. And they'd had a pastor there and he came in. And they had baptized like 48 or 49 people in six months. And the deacons of the church came to him and said, that's not the kind of church we want, and asked him to resign. And I just bowed and said, thank you, God, that I didn't go there. But, you know, not not every church wants to proclaim Jesus. Not every church wants to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and you know, we, we complain a lot in our churches, and we complain about, Oh, well, why do we need all these churches? Why do we need all these new church starts? That's exactly why we need them. Because there are churches all across America, Southern Baptist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Methodist, you, you name it. You name the denomination. They're all over America who have no desire to fulfill the commission of Christ. All they're doing is fulfilling their itch that they need on Sunday. And folks, I'm telling you, God did not, Jesus Christ did not come to this earth. He did not establish his church. He did not go to a cross so that we could show up and get tickled and get emotional and have a good time on Sunday morning. He came so that we could challenge one another, we could, uh, uh, we could encourage one another, and we could speak the truth to one another so that we might go forward and fulfill his commission. And what is his commission? Make disciples, not make converts make disciples. You know what it takes to make a disciple? It takes investment. It takes investment of time. Paul spent three months in the synagogue until they finally started saying, ah, and he was, he, was, he was getting into their power structure. He was getting into their, he was getting into their, he was plowing in their field. And they started talking bad about the way. He said, we don't want that anymore. So what did Paul do? He didn't throw up his hands and quit. He took the ones that really wanted to hear it. Listen, folks, this is why churches are starting today everywhere across America and across our area as well. Look at what Paul did. When some were, uh, were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took, away his, and took away the disciples. That's the ones that really wanted to learn. Some of them were believers already. Many of them were not. He took them away and reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus, he took the way the disciples, reasoning daily with, in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years. <laughs> two years. Paul invested time. Paul invested truth. Paul invested his talent into people. And you know, just like Paul wrote, we were studying uh, 2 Timothy this past Wednesday night. And we talked about the fact that when Paul wrote the, Timothy, second, the second letter to Timothy, which is most likely his last letter he ever wrote as far as that we have recorded, he wrote in that second chapter, he said, Timothy, take what I've taught you or I've entrusted to you and entrust it to other men who can entrust it to other men. That is the process of discipleship. Do we understand that the process of discipleship is that we make disciples who can make disciples? What is a disciple? A disciple is a learner. Has anyone ever taken you and taught you the scriptures? Probably not, much like me. I prayed a prayer as a young, as a young lad, and I came forward, and you know, somebody threw a Bible at me and said, go live a good Christian life, and I looked at them like, okay, what exactly does that mean? I, I didn't learn a lot about what it meant to walk with Christ until I got into seminary. <laughs> how, how pitiful is that? How awful is that as is, is, is a church, as is, is a Southern Baptist church who call ourselves a people of the book, that we are predominantly biblically illiterate today. That there's more Southern Baptists that convert to, 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 to faiths like um, Mormonism and Jehovah Witness, which are cults, not even Christian, but more people... Uh, or transition from Southern Baptist to those, those cults than any other denomination. Because we, you know why? Because we've, we've bought into this idea that we've prayed a prayer, we've, we've got our fire insurance, now I'm going to live my life however I want to, and it doesn't matter. Can I tell you, there's going to be a lot of people who've sat in church pews their whole life, and I'm not here, and I'm not here to scare anybody, folks. I'm here to tell you the truth. Because if I don't, I'm going to answer for it. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to, they're going to be just like I was. And one of these days, they're going to stand before God, and I hope that I, hope that I, can, I can ward off some of that. And God's going to say, Jesus is going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Because all we did was pray a prayer. 
Do you know there's nowhere in the Bible that tells us that's all we're supposed to do? You know what it tells me? I'm supposed to give my life for him. I'm supposed to sacrifice who I am for who he is. That's what Paul was reasoning. That's why Paul got kicked out many times, because it wasn't just about um, power and authority. It wasn't just about doing this. It was about surrendering your life. to. Do you know uh, more, there's more references to sacrifice and surrender in Scripture when it comes to the person of Christ than there is any other terminology? We are to sacrifice and we are to surrender. We are to be obedient to Christ. That's what Paul was teaching. He did that for two years. But here's the thing. Here's, you know, here's where you know you're investing in the right place. The next part of that says this. You're investing in the right place and you're investing in the right thing. It says, this took place for two years, verse 10, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. <laughs> now that doesn't mean that Paul preached to all of them. What that means is, is that the word of God got so into those people that Paul spent two years with that it spread like wildfire. Because they went back. Out of this ministry at Ephesus, this two and, two and a half year ministry at Ephesus that Paul had, there was about five or six different communities that where churches were planted. Now, these were home churches. But where they were planted and started from this Bible study, from this discipleship group. Do you know right now there's a church in Spartanburg, South Carolina, that's about a year and a half old? They've baptized 93 people. They have 17 young men right now who are feeling a, a, a call to lead churches and to pastor and to minister. And you, know, and you know how they do it? Every person that visits their church is asked to connect with a one-on-one -on -one discipler. They're asked to meet at least one time. Every person, they meet with every person that comes in their church, they meet with them one-on-one, -on -one and they talk to them about, the, the, the pastor started doing this mostly, and now it's caught fire, and they've got a bunch of people doing it. But, but you, you, you have, if you're going to be a member of that church, you have to agree to a six to 12-month discipleship ministry of meeting with somebody once a week for six to 12 months to be discipled in what it means to be a Christian. He told me the other day that he, most of the people, the reason they baptize so many is most people that come in their church to visit and they sit down with them, they realize either they've never trusted Christ or they really don't understand what it means to trust Christ through their discipleship ministry and they end up being baptized and, and, uh, and brought into the church. You know how many people have left that church in the last year and a half? Three. Three. And that's because they moved out of state for a job. That's what a church is supposed to be doing, folks. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But the problem is, where do we start? We have to start somewhere. Why not start here? Why not start now? Why not realize that our goal is to pour into people's lives, have people pour into my life, and to grow in our faith, to understand what it means to walk with Jesus, to not just if, not, not to, you know, you know how many people I ask on a regular basis who have been in church their whole life? I mean, people I know who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that have been in church their whole life, and I ask the question, or I'll hear somebody ask the question, or, you know, man, are you going to heaven when you die? And they say, I hope so. Good grief, folks. If we don't know we're going to heaven when we die, then what have we been doing for the last 60 years? What have we been doing for the last 218 years in this church? If you don't know for certain, man, then you need to get in the Word of God and find out what it means to know for certain so that when somebody asks me, you say, absolutely, I'm headed to heaven. Absolutely, I'm going to meet Jesus because he's my Savior and I've given my life to him. That's what Paul's telling. And when we learn that, when we understand that, it gets inside of us so much that we can't help but talk about it. We can't help but tell others about Jesus. We can't help but want to meet with other people and say, hey, let me tell you how my life was changed and how yours can be too. And guess what? I'm willing to walk with you through it week after week, after week, after week, year after year, to make sure that you understand what it means. You see, folks, we got to understand today that the Lord is, is still pouring out His Spirit. The Lord is still doing great things, and when we invest our time and our talents in the truth, things will change. The whole region heard about Jesus. They heard about the kingdom of God. He said, oh, I'm not sure about all that. 
<laughs> We're all disciples, right? My analogy in the first service was there was disciples all across the country yesterday. Matter of fact, they're such good disciples, they got up extra early. They packed up cars. They went to parking lots, and they gathered, and they cooked. They broke bread together. They spent hours together talking and conversing and, 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 and talking about their, their object of worship and, 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 and all the details of it. And then they all went into these great coliseums, and they shouted and sang. They raised their hands like a bunch of Pentecostals. They screamed and, and, and yelled and didn't, care, and, and didn't care who around them heard what they had to say. They didn't care who around them saw them worship. Obviously, you know I'm talking about college football, right? Okay, let's make sure. But yet we come to church. Oh, you know what? It's a little chilly this morning. I might not go. Sat out in the rain yesterday. I'm talking about a lot of them. But, oh, it's a little too, you know, we're, we're what is it, um, Little Red Riding, we're the Little Red Riding Hoods of, of, you know, it's a little, Goldilocks, there you go, thank you, Lauren. Boy, what, I'm bad, my kids are too old. Goldilocks, little, what is, yeah, Little Red Riding, that's the Big Bad Wolf, that's the Big Bad Wolf, yeah. Wrong one, wrong nursery rhyme. You, you ever thought about the, nur- I'm sorry, you ever thought about the nursery rhymes we tell our kids? Good gracious. But anyway, uh, that's a whole other story. Um, but Goldilocks. We're, we're Goldilocks Christians. Y'all know that? Well, this is a little too cold. This is a little too hot. That's a little too hard. That's a little too soft. When are we going to find what's just right? You know what's just right? The message of the word. The truth. The truth of the gospel. And Paul said that he taught this for two years, and, and, and it spread like wildfire. And listen, listen, I love this part. Baptists don't like this part. Verse 11 and 12 says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that handkerchief, actually that term handkerchief means sweat rag. What I didn't say a while ago was when Paul was teaching, Paul, the Hall of Tyrannus, the reason he could teach there is because he was teaching from like 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock. This was the time that most people in the Middle East take siestas. They, they didn't do anything. So Paul took the worst possible time, spent the most possible time in the most uncomfortable place to teach these people the gospel, and they came anyway. They didn't even have air conditioning or heat. Some of y'all wish we didn't have air conditioning right now because my hands are cold. Uh, some of you don't, I mean, didn't have heat, didn't have air. Paul had a, a, a bandana around his head or a towel around his waist where he could wipe the sweat. And, and the power of God was so strong, was going forth so much that, that, that they were taking these towels and, and were laying them on people and they were being healed because the power of God was so strong in what Paul was teaching. Now, let me tell you something. That's not prescriptive. I was watching a TV show, preacher, not too long ago. I guess it's been about 10 or 15 years ago. And he was preaching out of this passage of Scripture. He was preaching out of this passage of Scripture, and he said, he, he said, if you'll send me $20, at the end of the show, if you'll send me $20, we've got these handkerchiefs that, we've, that, are, that are blessed. We've put them on the altar. We've prayed to them all. And if you'll send us $20, we'll send you one of these prayer hankies, and you can use it and experience God's healing. Like, he done lost his mind. <laughs> that is not what the Scripture is telling us. That is not a prescriptive way to do ministry. You know what it is? It's a testimony of when people get right with God and they get serious about serving God, that those kind of miracles will follow them. Jesus said, you see what I've done? You'll do greater works than these if you just believe. If you just believe the truth. If you receive the truth and allow the truth of God to guide your life. You said, Mark, I, I don't know what to do. How, how do we get started? How do we do this? How do we get started? I told you a minute ago. I, I, start with your circle of influence. Start with the people you 
work alongside. Start with the people who live in your neighborhood. Start with the people that you just know, especially start with, the, um, with those that don't know Christ. Those that maybe you've had conversations with and you know they don't know Christ, and just ask them, invite them to lunch. Invite them to a, a, a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a Diet Pepsi, whatever you like to have, or, or a cupcake. I mean, that, that's always good. Invite them to something and talk to them. Share your story with them. And listen to theirs. And then point them to Jesus. Start with prayer. Start with love. Start with compassion. Start with recognizing that if some of these people in our community died tomorrow, they would have to face the wrath of God and that they would not be able to see him face to face for all of eternity. Start somewhere. But just start. You see, we have been placed here, and God has sustained this church for 218 years, not so that we can be idle, but so that we can proclaim the truth to those who are perishing. The commission hasn't changed, folks. And it's not just for pastors. It's not just for Sunday school teachers. It's not just for deacons. It's not just for musicians. It's for every one of us. If we proclaim the name of Christ... For every one of us. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? Where are you going to invest? Because I'm going to tell you what, if you want to return, if you want to pay back, you got to invest. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes struggle. It takes heartache. Can I tell you this? It's worth it. It's worth every ounce of energy you'll ever put into it when you invest in someone for the cause of Christ. Will you do that today?